My name is Michał Dominiak, in case you wondered how to pronounce that and haven't seen the lightning tongue last year. Uh, I work at Nokia in Wrocław, Poland, and this is a talk that uh, is trying to tell you how I approach doing semantic analysis on, on two projects with a tiny little sprinkle of real world at the very end. Uh, it doesn't try to be like a comprehensive guide to anything, just some stories. Maybe with a, like some takeaway, I hope. Uh, all right, so let's start with the structure of compilers and interpreters. Uh, depending on the language, the structure is pretty similar for both. Uh, they, they cl like the classical divide is for the front end, something in the middle and the back end, right? But I, I want to go into the more uh, specific parts, parts of the compiler. So for, for a compiler to do its job, it has to understand what it's, wor what it's working on, right? Uh, as the source code is usually written down as pure text, it has to first parse the text to actually understand what's going on. Because working on an so actual source code would is not, not the most pleasant thing to do as a program. Uh, some people claim that we could actually improve the situation by storing a tokenized or a, or a parsed AST in a file instead of as just, just the text representing the source of the program. Uh, th those people tend to argument that uh, that would save a lot of work, but the work that would be saved isn't very significant in the, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, all right, so, so parsers, as you probably know, produce ASTs, so abstract syntax trees. Uh, the phrase AST is very much overloaded for, for different things, and uh, everybody who starts working on something related to ASTs invents a new way to explain what that is, or a new way to use the term. Uh, but generally, it's an abstract syntax tree. It's abstract in the sense that it doesn't contain all the symbols that were in the source file. Things like parents around expressions are not to be found in an AST because the parser is going to use the parents to figure out what's the pre precedence of the expressions in the, in the source, uh, but it's not actually going to save that information because it's not, use it's not useful. What's useful is the hierarchy of expressions and what's wh wh what, pretense, what precedence is where. Uh, the parser is supposed to detect invalid uses uh, of the language's, language's syntax. Uh, this is not always where it happens, but this is this is the least awkward way, uh, the least awkward place to, to actually implement checking of syntax. <coughs> you can you can do some stuff in the lexer uh, to check if there is invalid identifiers or whatever, but this is the place to actually check the syntax. Uh, I gave a talk about this two years ago here. Uh, there's different ways to approach building parsers. Uh, some uh, applications uh, will prefer having a parser generator. Uh, my talk talked about actually building recursive descent par parsers manually, which is uh, quite a pleasant experience if the language is structured in a way that's not insane, C, C++, that as an example of something that's not sane. All right, uh, the next stage of the compiler is generally a semantic analyzer. So it's, it's the part of the compiler that is going to look at the AST and is going to try to figure out what is what. So it uh, tries to resolve the names that, that are included in the AST to know what, refer what token refers to what. Uh, it's going to type check our program in general, generally, and possibly validates further aspects of the language. Uh, this would be like template instantiations in C++ or the borrow checker in, in Rust. Uh, and this is what this talk is about. Right. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Uh, so this is the part that I want to talk about. Uh, 
So the, 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 the case of C++ is very curious because uh, what does this line of code mean? Whatever you want. Whatever I want. <laughs> That's a quite good answer because what, what, what does it mean now? It's a pointer declaration. What does it mean now? Two declarations. No, no, that the, the line. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's multiplication. It's a statement that multiplies those two variables. It's not a very useful statement, but... Uh, uh, those are integers, so you cannot overload it. Well, technically, you have zero instructions for the two e. Yes. <laughs> yes, that, this is the best optimization you can do in a program because it causes the program to be invalid. <laughs> that, that, that's not the point. The point is, uh, this line by itself doesn't mean anything in C++. It needs context to actually make any sort of sense. Uh, this is not really C++'s fault. This is a fault of C, yeah? It could, it could be worse. It could be CL1. It could be... CL1. It has no keywords. It's <laughs> the <of> <laughs> Comment is it could be worse. It can always be worse, but <laughs> this is this is pretty much a fault of C, right? Because uh, the, the the declaration syntax from C looks like expressions, uh, which potentially made sense back back when it was invented, because of how the compilers had very limited limited resources to work with. But it's pain really painful currently to to actually write programs. And it's probably most her most painful for whoever tries to write tooling for C++, right? right. So uh, C++, the same as C. Well, the w one more comment. C++, it's kind of a fault of C++ because C++ could have just used it other syntax, but yeah. All right, so C++ is uh, pretty much has at least a context-sensitive grammar. And a while ago, I, I've, I've seen a, an argument for why it's actually an unrestricted grammar. A and I think, it, I think it invoked the fact that you can write a program which, uh, whose uh, syntactic validity depended on a specific, on a value of a specific template argument. So we can write a program in C++ that is either valid or invalid syntactically, depending on whether a number is a prime. In case parsing C++ sounded too easy, right? So, so I, I, I kind of buy the argument that it's actually unrestricted. But I, I'm not a linguist, and uh, th there if there was a linguist uh, in the room, that I would probably be corrected many times already. Uh, all right. So parsing C++ without doing uh, some sort of semantic analysis is technically possible because you could like try to make a parse tree with branches for all possible parses of a given part of syntax and then like throw away the branches that are not valid during analysis. But that makes no sense, right? It would use so much memory and actually going through the AST would be so painful that it makes it doesn't make a lot of sense. So so there is one particular part of the C++, C++ grammar that kind of uh, forces us to tell the compiler what we mean without actually knowing what it does, right? So the template, the, the type name and the template disambiguators. Uh, so inside a template, the compiler doesn't actually know what T colon colon type is, right? We have to tell it that it's a type because the choice was made to uh, for for t colon colon type, where t is a dependent name to always mean a value and not a type. And uh, this is also the reason for why uh, for why uh, the standard get for tuples and variants is not a member function, because we in generic context we would have to use the horrible syntax and the variant of the last line. Yes, Alistair. Uh, yeah. uh, are you are you saying about down with type name or yeah? So so there is a paper that has been accepted and will be uh, probably uh, slightly 
Uh, I, I, I think I kind of mentioned it, comment in the in the answer. Uh, there's been a paper that was ac ac accepted and will probably be partially unaccepted at the next meeting uh, called down with type name and it removed a lot of places where you had to say type name. Did it also remove the template in That's some places? Uh, if you add all the storage URL. Right. So in places where it's obvious that we need that we want a type, it will no longer be necessary to write type name, which is how pre-standard C++ worked. Uh, but it's it's it shouldn't be very hard for the parser, but it's probably going to make the life of some people slightly less easy. All right. Uh, so so the next stage of the compiler. And I, I'm using this very, uh, I'm not trying to be very strict because some compilers don't actually run optimizers themselves and only pipe their results into an optimizer in some other program. Uh, so an optimizer, the job of the optimizer is to simplify the program, right? Take complex things, spit out simple things. Uh, it sounds very simple. Uh, but it's not so simple. Some some transformation of some transformations of the AST are actually quite simple to do. As like if you if you can detect that, that a condition of an if, if statement is always false, you can just throw away the true branch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but some some optimizations uh, require a lot of work and and looking at a at a very wide context of, of stuff. Uh, and I don't dare even entertain the thought of giving a talk about this because it's crazy. Uh, right. So then we then we go into a code generator, usually. Uh, so it generates the code for consumption by, by the next program in the pipeline. Uh, we don't usually think of things that generate machine code directly to be a compiler, right? We usually consider that to be an assembler. So this while this is not very strict, uh, it's I think more useful than being strict. Uh, so we'll usually we'll, we'll generate some flavor of assembly or LVMIR, right? Uh, so so this usually happens in a compiler, but if you have a JIT, you are also going to generate some code. And it's probably not as interesting of a talk as the previous ones. Although I guess that somebody who knows uh, about algorithms for register allocation and things like that would probably be able to make an entertaining C++ now talk. Uh, and then we have an execution engine, which is usually a part of an interpreter. Uh, but as you may see, this sentence is not finished because you can ask your local C++ developer about consexpr. Which is, which is, uh, as I understand, one of the most crazy parts of C++ <laughs> to properly implement a in a compiler, <coughs> if you if you want to be correct. Uh, so, so this talk actually slightly touches on this topic, but doesn't go deep. Like most, it's most like mo it's mostly just just a short mention of of the problems here, uh, or or a way to to actually do this. All right. Uh, so this is a talk about semantic analyzers, but it mentions parsers in the title, uh, which is why we couldn't really skip the part about parsers. Uh, this is kind of a re rehash, uh, very short rehash of, of some parts of, my of the previous tag I've mentioned, uh, but it's good to remember how things stand. So there's kind of two ways to construct an AST. Uh, you can have an AST that is uh, statically poly polymorphic or one that is dynamically poly polymorphic. Uh, so, so for dynamically polymorphic AST, it's, it's as it usually is with dynamic class hier hierarchies, right? So it's easy to extend dynamically, uh, but you have to use virtual dispatch for visitation. Uh, there are multiple techniques for this, but they are never pretty. Uh, oh yeah, and you can use like techniques that use dynamic cast, which are probably slightly less pretty when it comes to implementation, but slightly nicer for, for the user. Uh, 
All right, so, so one way to, to, have a, uh, to have visitation in a polymorphic ASD is to do something like this, right? You have, a, you have a, uh, some interface for a visitor. Uh, it has a multitude of functions for all the different ASD nodes that you can think of. Uh, it allows to inherit from it, implement actual visitation of the nodes. And then you have an expression, a base class that has a visit thing, which takes a visitor and you implement the actual visitation uh, inside the uh, direct classes. Uh, the function at the very end is going to look exactly the same in pretty much every type that's an ASD node, which sounds very bad, right? Uh, if, if you want to know an answer how to, how to make this slightly less bad by not having to repeat it everywhere, uh, go to this gentleman's talk in the next time walk. Uh, all right. In what? In Hudson. In Hudson. All right. Uh, you could do something crazy like this. Uh, so, so you don't have to actually completely understa understand the code. Uh, but there is an, an ordered map of callbacks. And what we do is we register the, a callback for a specific uh, type ID of a type that we want to visit. And there are some templates to actually wrap the callbacks that we want to have. Uh, this is nicer for the user, because the user can just have a set of functions for all the specific uh, types that he cares about. Doesn't have to like, like derive from visitors and override virtual functions and so on. <coughs> uh, it looks more crazy though, the, at least the implementation, right? All right, so uh, the other way we can do this is, uh, is to have static polymorphism. Uh, so this is going to be harder to, uh, to extend and every time we try to do something new in the ASD, we are going to have to recompile the whole thing. Uh, but we can always be sure that we handle all the types in the ASD, because the compiler is going to type check everything for us. And uh, we are probably going to use a implementation of variants somewhere, right? To implement this. Uh, so, so in this scheme, uh, an expression can look something like this. So, so it's basically a variant of some kinds of, an expre of expressions. Tho those don't really make sense, but whatever. Uh, and then to visit it, you, you, just, you just visit the variant. So, so fmap in this case is just standard visit that actually still returns a variant and not a single concrete type. Uh, so this is kind of nicer to the user, uh, but at the same time, these those analyze expression functions can be very long. Uh, it's uh, I mean it's not like like compiler developers actually care about the length of a function. If you look at the source code of some compilers, you will find some some monsters. So that's probably not an argument against this, but. If you if you care about your functions being pretty, it's it's probably going to matter. All right. So what? Why does it matter? Uh, if we want to consume an AST in the analyzer, we have to have some way to actually walk the AST, right? So we are going to have to visit the AST, and the way we structured it is going to uh, make is going to force some design decisions in the analyzer. Uh, and making the EST polymorphic uh, requires us to either make the parser aware of the analyzer's type. So in this case, it's kind of getting like coupled in both ways. Uh, or we need to use some crazy dynamic scheme of, of visitation of the AST to actually allow the analyzer to go through things. <coughs> Clang <coughs> is doing something else. Uh, we'll talk about Clang, but Clang doesn't actually... Clang doesn't technically walk the AST from the parser, because technically there is no AST from the parser, but we'll, we'll get to that. 
All right, so uh, it should be kind of obvious from the way that I've uh, written those slides that I don't really like dynamic, dynamically polymorphic ASDs, right? Uh, I like the statically polymorphic ASDs. Uh, they give me very a very clear interface on the parser's boundary. They give me something very concrete. I don't have to like wonder what could possibly in there be in there when when I'm writing a visitor. I don't have to go through the documentation and whatnot. I just need to like write a visitor and fix and add another case for every every time the compiler tells me, tells me I'm not handling some type. I, I'm a big fan of, of compilers uh, actually uh, making documentation not necessary. <coughs> All right. So once we have an ASD, we have to somehow process it, right? Uh, so so there's, there's a couple different design decisions that we have to make. Uh, there's a probably a lot of more than it I tried to cover here. Uh, but those are the most obvious, and they kind of follow from what the language is, what it allows, and so on. Uh, so the simplest way to go for uh, from an AST to an analyzed tree of fingers in the analyzer uh, is to just go through the AST once, right? Just go once, visit everything. Uh, Set in self, we set ourselves on fire if anything is not resolved by the time we get to an AST node. Tell the user, ah, you screwed up, you are stupid, or some other, other more nicer compiler error message. Uh, so this is the simplest way to actually do things. We, we just look at, the, at, at every node that we visit, we just look at the state of the world at that point, we don't need anything else. So we just go through and we are done. We can have multiple passes. Oh, and, and, and this, is, this is fine uh, in a language where everything has to be defined before it is used, right? It's mostly fine. Uh, C++ isn't exactly this because we have some places where we can have things used before they are defined. Think class scopes. There's been... Uh, we, we fixed the problem with uh, consexpert functions being defined in the wrong place when the class is not a template, right? Do you remember? You fixed something, I don't know what we fixed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think there was like a DR that tried to make the behavior of consexpert functions uh, defined in a class and in a class template but be the same. Because up until, to, uh, up until a certain point, uh, if you used a consexpert function before it was used at a class scope, uh, it failed to compile because it wasn't defined yet. But if you made the whole class a template, it suddenly start started to work. Which is one of the beautiful dragons of C++. All right. Uh, we can have multiple passes. Uh, can go in order. Of course, we could go in a different order, but we usually want to be deterministic in a compiler, right? So we want we pick an order, we always go in that order. Uh, but we can go through the AST multiple times. Uh, we can do a set number of iterations, and I'm sure there are some languages that actually do this. Uh, or we can keep going until everything is resolved. Except this have a problem. Infinite what? Uh, infinite loop, rather, yeah, yeah. We can loop infinitely when the user does something wrong, doesn't understand how to write programs, etc. Uh, so we are probably going to just loop at for as long as we make progress. When we stop making progress, we go out of the loop, we check whether we've actually resolved everything. If not, we tell the user that his program has a problem, yes. Determinating condition for the compiler is the OAM killer. Well, why? Because you can write a busy beaver. I can write what? A busy beaver. A program that always makes progress but can do inordinately long. Yeah, that's a very good one. 
So, so the comment is that you can construct a program which always makes progress by n but never finishes, uh, which is why you would do something else <laughs> than just a simple loop like this. Uh, this is fine for one of the languages that I talk about in this talk. It's not fine for the other, because in the other one, you actually need something like uh, like the template death limit or whatever you call this. All right, and another way that is vastly different from the previous two ones is to somehow build a, tr a tree of elements that we have that are kind of partially constructed, even though this is uh, mostly not the right term here, but uh, you can map the AST into something else or start annotating the AST, but uh, you gather the information about the dependencies of each, of each node and tell those dependencies to analyze themselves and you go until you reach some leaf nodes and you go then go back up. Yeah. What is DAG? Uh, what is DAG? It's a direct as acyclic graph. Uh, so it's a graph that has directed edges and doesn't contain cycles. Yeah, and, and at the end you execute the DAG. Uh, futures are awesome for this. Short futures uh, are the most awesome for this uh, because it's, it's very natural to like say, when all of those are ready, then execute my stuff. Uh, this is like executing DAGs is is why futures that I that are just like one shot channels uh, isn't enough because with a one shot channel we would repeat all the work every time right and here we can just we can call analyze on something that will give us a future to where when it finishes and everybody else who calls analyze gets the same future and everybody can depend on the same amount of work. All uh, right, and coroutines will make this nicer, although I'm, uh, I'm really, uh, I really want a paper that is not, not public yet to actually make them nicer, even nicer to work with. Uh, all right, and another like kind of a choice we have to make is whether we want to annotate the AST in place or create a completely new data structure. Uh, so we avoid uh, allocating more memory in if we just uh, annotate the AST from the parser. Uh, it's quite possibly easier to debug because the addresses stay the same. So we can like we can just make a breakpoint in the parser, check the address of something, then use that to make further breakpoints in the analyzer, right? Uh, it's kind of necessary for C++ since you are analyzing during parsing uh, with the exception that for, I don't know how GCC does this because I wasn't brave enough to actually venture into GCC's code. Uh, but Clang does something slightly different here. Uh, but if we generate a new structure, uh, then this allows us to have better encapsulation, like, like better separation of concerns between the parser and the, and the analyzer. Uh, and we have more flexibility in the, par in the analyzer to actually generate the structures that we want, right? Because the parser will have some way it wants the, the data structures to look like. And that doesn't exactly have to be the same thing that the analyzer wants. Those can differ. So it gives us more flexibility. All right, this is going faster than I thought. All right, uh, so what I tried in an interpreter, uh, the word interpreter is used kind of non-strictly here. Uh, it's a project to have a build system that uses a declarative language to describe it. As simple of a language as possible. So you have, you have identifiers, uh, just looking on the, on the right-hand side of the assignments. Uh, you have identifiers, you have strings. 
you can concatenate the strings. You can concatenate other things too. Uh, you can, for, for example, if you have two, two objects that uh, represent some number of source files, you can add them together to, do a, uh, to sum the sets together. Uh, you can subtract them from each other to get a set difference. Uh, and the last thing that there is is something that I, wh when I first implemented this, I called it uh, instantiation because the idea was that buzz, in this case, is a type, and this is a constructor call. Uh, this is not something that I would do if I was free writing this now, because there are some places where those are really just function calls. Uh, but this is the language. Nothing is mutable. Uh, everything has exactly one definition, and the order doesn't matter. So as you can see, I have a bar at the top that is used to initialize foo, and then I only define what bar is at the very end, right? Does this language make sense to you? It's meant to be like the simplest possible uh, configuration language that I could think of. Uh, I want to like pull it into a library since it's kind of uh, embedded into, into the build system thingy right now, which is not ideal. All right, so Parsing this is quite simple, and uh, the parser for this I actually discussed in the previous talk. Uh, so for the analyzer, we have, we have a few cases, right? Those are all the cases that we have in the language. So we, we, can, we have an expression that refers to something else by name. We have an expression that is a constant string. We have an expression that is something like, like a function call and we have an expression that is like a binary operation of, of concatenations and subtractions and whatnot. <coughs> All right, so string literals are quite simple, right? They are just constant, so we don't have to do anything in the, anal in the analyzer. So we just create an, a, a node of the analyzed AST that says, this is a string, this is its value. For names, we, we encounter the first problem because we can, we can go through the AST and encounter a name that hasn't been defined yet. So we have to try to resolve the name, and if the name is known, uh, then we just create a node that refers to the actual value of that name. So we just pretty much just grab a new short pointer to the same object that we had previously. If it is not known, uh, we aren't going to do any crazy things. We are just going to create a node, an unresolved, uh, sorry, a delayed expression, uh, which is going to save the information about what the identifier was. And it, the result of this is we get an object that's, that has an identity that represents the expression. And later on, we can use that identity. Uh, we can update quotes that identity to actually refer to what was created after that. OK, we have an addition. Uh, and we analyze the, we uh, see if the operands are, uh, are known at this point. And if they are resolved, then we can just evaluate the operation because the operations are supposed to evaluate immediately as they are known. Uh, so if we know everything, we can just act on it, right? If there is anything that we do not, do not know, so if any one of those or both of them, we just save them uh, and we mark the delayed expression to know that it's actually an addition or some other operation. And we have type instantiation. This is very similar to the previous one. So we check whether all, all the arguments are resolved and we check whether the name of the thing we are constructing is resolved because it can also be a variable in this. And we do the same thing, right? So if everything is already resolved, we just instantiate the thing. And if anything is not resolved yet, we again create a yet different, ex yet different case of a uh, delayed expression. Right, so this is the initial pass. <coughs> this is simple, just goes through all the entire AST ones and builds information about what we do not yet know. 
and this is very tiny code that basically uh, shows the states that the delayed expression can be in. So there is that it doesn't really matter, right? This is a variant of, of different things. One of the one of them is a short pointer to an actual thing. So one of the states is already re resolved thingy, right? Okay, and then we have to try to resolve everything. And this is a case of the loop that I talked about before. So we save the, the number of things that are currently not resolved yet. Uh, we loop through all of them, telling them to see if they can resolve themselves themselves yet. Uh, at the end, we again check the number of currently unresolved expressions. And if those two numbers are different, we continue looping. If those two numbers are the same at the end of one of the iterations, that means we, we made no progress. And that means that we are finished. Either to tell the user that they have a problem or or to finish successfully. Yeah. How do you support stuff like desugaring in this case? Because desugaring often generates more unresolved expressions from the end. How do I? I don't actually do that. I mean, clearly, but <laughs> <laughs> the question is, how do you? How do you? Uh, how do you handle the sugaring? Yeah, so 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 let, let, let me give an example of, of syntax the sugaring. Uh, for example, in, in the other language I talk about in here, I have a statement that defines what is uh, defines as a structure. So just like a C plus plus structure definition. Uh, the parser doesn't actually have a separate way to to re represent that. What the parser has is a structure definition expression. So as if you s wrote let x equals struct open brace and write the, de write the members. And when the parser sees the definition that looks like the C++ one, it just translates, it that, uh, translates that into a declaration where, where the type of the variable is type and the initializer expression is the struct. Uh, so how do, I, how do you handle this here? Uh, you would probably have some other counter some other variable to, to track track those. Uh, you could do something like breaking as soon as you successful like like sorry continuing as soon as you s successfully resolved something, and s have some other condition for for the sugaring. If you if you for example resolved one but that created another one, you could like have have a separate condition for that. Uh, so the comment is that if you add a new unresolved expression, that's progress. But this is the algorithm, uh, which looks like this in the actual code, doesn't handle that case because it only compares counts. Uh, you could do something li like, I don't know, try to hash all the things in the map of unresolved things in compare the caches or something else. Uh, you are first. <laughs> How does this handle if two names depend on each other, uh, like a circle? Uh, at some point, you're still making progress. Because like foo equals bar and bar equals foo. Uh, so foo equals bar, the bar is going to be a delayed expression because it doesn't know what bar is yet. Get to bar, that's going to, to name foo and it's never going to resolve. Uh, I don't know how to explain it right now, but it definitely doesn't work. Like, it definitely goes down to analysis error. Uh, yeah. But aren't we preserving results there from the previous pass? So all we need to care is if we resolve one thing, one or more, we've made progress. Because we're not continually re-resolving the same things over and over. So, so the comment is, we don't have to preserve the state from previously because we are not continuously doing the same thing, right? 
if you wanted to actually like handle the case of, of adding new unresolved things while resolve, resolving the other ones, uh, you could make a copy of context.unresolved and just compare them instead of comparing the sizes. Right? Yeah. We just solved this by try resolve return true. Like if you make progress in return true and and continue. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You could you could resolve this by try resolve returning bool. Yeah, sure. Because you always know from try resolve. Yeah, yeah. So so there's one thing that I haven't talked about yet in here. Try resolve is a very simple function. It goes into the state, and if this if the delayed thing is an unresolved state, it tries to do the same thing as previously. So it tries oh oh the wrong way. Sorry. It tries to do this. It never recurses. So if you have if you have an addition and left-hand side is already resolved, and the right-hand side isn't, we are not going to call try resolve on the right-hand side. For at least two reasons. One, uh, we could actually lose some information of what we are doing, because there would be, like, we could return true if that was resolved, but that's not actually what we mean, right? It, when, when something says that try resolved, exited successfully, it means it resolved itself, right? That's what it should mean, at least, by the name. The other problem is that if we have a very big file that has, like, like a very deep ASD, if we try to resolve recursively, we can run out of stack. This is why we don't try resolve recursively. But that's not a problem, because uh, maybe we first try to resolve the addition and then the right-hand side. But that's fine. In the first iteration, uh, we will resolve the right-hand side. In the second one, we will re resolve the addition, right? So it might cause some more iterations of this loop. But that's not a problem. Right. Is that good? Okay. So I promised some success stories and some horror stories. That was a success story. You can guess what comes next. Okay, so uh, a few words ab about the language that I'm trying to compile. It looks kind of like C++, but tries to avoid a lot of the syntactic ambiguities that C++ has, and a lot of restrictions that are very irritating for me daily when I actually write C++. So it's like an experiment. You could call it a research project. Uh, I don't know how to, how to call it best, but uh, it's a language I'm trying to construct so that I can enjoy writing code in it and not be frustrated every two days. Uh, okay, so, so it kind of looks like C++ with some additional uh, things it can do. All right, so my first attempt at writing an analyzer for this, because a parser I just wrote, it worked. I think it was the first, first recursive lesson parser I wrote, and it worked. That's good. Looks like I've, I, uh, it seems like I have the right intuition for writing parsers, but not so much for analyzers. Uh, this is how an expression looks like in the grammar, mostly, right? It's, it's one of some number of possible expression types that are in the language. <coughs> some of them have to be recursive wrappers because we don't know the definition yet, thanks C++. Uh, but this this is fair, this works fairly well, yeah. Uh, what's the range for? Uh, range. What what's the range for? Uh, the range is saving the information where in the source file this AST node came from. So so a range is basically two positions, and a position is an offset into the file, the, the line number and the column number. 
so something for tracking the information. Uh, it's very frustrating for me when I look at parser generators and don't they don't have something like this, because I suddenly I have to start hacking around to get the basic information that a parser should give me. This is this is a part of the reasons why I like actually hand rolling a parser. All right, so, so my first idea was, I have this nice structure. What if I just did the same in the analyzer, or mostly the same? So I would have classes for, for different things. They would have some common interface. And then I had an expression which was a variant of those things. And then I could have a function that was meant to analyze an expression. So what would it do? Well, it would dispatch to the correct thing that's inside and call analyze, right? Uh, so there's a bunch of problems with this. Uh, one of the problems is that you really, really want state expressions to be statements in a compiler. Because there is a lot of ways to just use an expression as a statement. If you have to wrap that in something else, it's crazy town. Uh, there is a lot of code that is shared between all the different expression types, or kinds rather, to not confuse terms. Uh, one of them is, for example, something like tracking the type of the expression. So here, I would have to have a mixin that saves the type and has a way to save the type and has a way to retrieve the type and inherit from the mixing in all the expression classes to not have to repeat that code over and over again. Uh, there was a bunch of problems like this with it. And uh, it's, it's hard to explain all of them because it was a while ago, but it kind of made me forget about this project for, for a year or so. Because I was just stuck and I didn't have an idea how to re how to do it better, so it was left to its own problems. And then I actually wrote the other thing, the build system thing, where I decided to well, it didn't really work for me to do static polymorphism there. Maybe I should just try dynamic polymorphism. Maybe that will work out. And it did work out. So I decided to come back to this project. And I did something slightly more sensible. So I ended up with something that has like two passes, although the, uh, the second one can, I, I don't think it can really be called a pass. Uh, so the first pass does something similar to the initial pass of the previous thing. So it just goes through everything in the ASD and creates the analyzer nodes for all of those nodes. It saves the information about the names that are referred to, about the sub-expressions and so on. And at the same time, it fills up the scopes. So when I create a node, it's directly tied to a name in a scope already. So I don't try to resolve names at this stage. And the second pass actually builds a DAG of dependencies between the different expression things and tells and analyzes them from the top to bottom and goes back up again. And only in that phase I try to actually resolve names, resolve calls, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I had a very nice class hierarchy, which really made most of the repetition go away, except the ones that that no, our beautiful language doesn't allow me to get rid of. Uh, expressions are, st are statements now. So I can just have an expression in a place where ex I expect a statement and that, that works, which is nice. Uh, and I can extend like similar kinds of expressions <coughs> between each other. So one canonical example of this is an identifier. So, it, so a single token being an identifier that refers to an expression is really a reference to a different expression. It refers to something else. And most of the code between expression ref, which is something that usually arises f 
from doing AST transformations is the same as in the identifier, except for the part where the ident identifier actually looks into a scope and resolves what that is, resolves what that is. So I had three main base classes. I had statement from which expression was derived. I had type and I had, uh, does anybody want to try to guess what I thought I needed? Declaration? No. Declaration is a statement. No, I didn't have a concept. I have variable. I thought I needed this. I was, for, for the longest time I was convinced that, well, I have an expression, I need something that will represent the value of that expression. So I called that variable. So now expressions had variables, variables have types. And the variables represented the value. So if I had a constant, it was just a different kind of a variable. The expression stayed the same. But then I started having weird things. Like an expression variable. It's a variable that wraps an expression that it owns. Oh, sorry. So I had places where I was given an expression, but I needed a variable. So, well, the obvious answer is I need an expression variable, right? So I'm going to convert from one to the other. Then for some reason I started having variable expression. And expression ref variable, because I was given an expression ref and I needed a variable. So expression variable was owned the expression. Expression ref variable was only a reference to the variable. And then came a day when I needed a variable ref expression, and that, <laughs> <laughs> that was just too much. <coughs> I, 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 stopped, I stopped doing anything new, and it took me like a two weeks, and the, there, there wasn't a lot of code yet. And it already took me two weeks to take out variable, because I realized that I don't actually need this. I had, for example, a function called select overload, which was given a set of functions that could possibly be the correct one to call given the number of arguments. And I had two overloads, one that was taking a vector of variables, the other that was taking a vector of expressions. So that way, that's what I had, and that made no sense. So I took variable out and started just using the expression itself as the value of the expression and it's so much better now. So so I guess what? Is it, and that actually makes sense. Yeah, and that actually makes sense. So so my problem, what what actual what was my actual problem in this is I didn't notice that expressions and variables were isomorphic. I didn't notice that this is basically the same thing. I can transform one to the other. It, it wasn't until I, I actually looked back at this and I was like, wait a second. I'm translating both ways. That means that they are probably the same thing, right? So... Uh, you can't change the value of an expression without changing the expression because you can change the variable. Yeah, you can change the value of one without changing the value of the other. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess the takeaway fr from this part is uh, think hard about whether the two abstractions that you have are isomorphic or not. Because and so I was I was so sure that I need something that represents a value. It was so obvious to me <laughs> until I realized that wait a second, this is the same thing. All right, so. What the analyzer actually does here is it goes for a DAG of dependencies and analyzes things. Uh, so this is mostly how the syntax for, uh, how the interface for expression looks like. Uh, you can set the type, you can get the type, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, there's this weird way to say that the future is actually the same with however many times you call this. Uh, Python has such nice ways to actually say some things. So every time you call analyze on the same expression, you will get the same future, right? 
This is actually a function of statement and not of expression, but that wouldn't fit on the slide. Yeah. So I just wanted to know where you keep the context. In order where I keep the context. Uh, currently, the futures live inside the expression, or rather inside the statement. Uh, I have a plan to actually change that because I have analysis context, right? So, so the analysis context actually comes from the top level call. The top level thing that calls all those analysis functions creates it, and before it's destroyed, it calls get on the final future. So it's it, it's always a l it's always a reference that's alive during all of those. The analysis context when you call analyze. Yeah. You created well. You either look up or create a new analysis feature. You put it into the context, and you also return it. I actually put it inside the expression and then inside the context, but I intend to move that into the context and I return it. Yes. So, so the next time that, oh, the rest of my slides is slightly wrong. wrong. Doesn't matter. Uh, so the next time somebody calls the same analyze on the same object, he gets the same feature. Oh, on the same object. Okay. Yeah, on the same object. Yes. So it's right, keyed. So it's so keyed so per per the address. Per Uh, there's a lot of places where, like, like I try to have a clear ownership model. So there's always somebody who owns an expression. Uh, but there are other things that need to refer to that expression. The easiest way to do that is just have the ob all the objects have stable addresses and handout pointers. Right? Plus, they are polymorphic, so stuffing them into a unique pointer actually makes sense. And then I have something like a binary expression uh, where I own the left-hand side and right-hand side expressions. Uh, funny story about op. Yesterday, while making slides, I noticed that I had a typo in the operator word. It was operator. And then I fixed the typo and 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 only later I realized, oh wait, that's a keyword. <laughs> All right, so, so I, I have these things that participate in what a binary expression is. And then I have this thing called call expression. Because at I, ha I have binary expressions, I have postfix expressions, and they serve basically the same purpose, right? To call a function. Be it a built-in function that adds integers, or a custom function that does something else. This is the purpose of those expressions. Uh, so so I, I had a lot of duplication, and there came a day where I just, wait a second, I could just make a call expression. A separate class that does all the crazy stuff, uh, and all the binary expressions, all the postfix expressions would actually hold this. Uh, binary expression is actually a type that disappears later on during like the simplification of the AST. Uh, and, and the AST at the very end is mostly just uh, expression refs, call expressions, constant expressions, and runtime, uh, runtime expressions. And everything else disappears, which is quite nice. All right, so I have a way to analyze this, right? So first, I analyze the, op the operands for the operation, right? So I need to know what LHS is, what R RHS is. So when all of them are, are finished, uh, I can call this magic function that does overload resolution. So it takes LHS and RHS. This is the overload for like binary operations. And it based on the types of LHS and RHS, it figures out which what functions could possibly be called, chooses the one that's best, and returns a call expression. So we don't actually have to care about how to construct a call expression here, because the resolve overload does this for us. We save the call expression, we analyze the call expression, because resolve overload just gives us a unique pointer, making it also return a future so that it could call analyze uh, I tried to do that, it didn't work out. And then I just set a type 
when I'm done. So I propagate the type of the call expression onto myself. Uh, now try to visualize how this would look like uh, if all of those dot dense would be co awaits. Test as a thought experiment. So, analyze doesn't actually execute immediately because when you call analyze, uh, it creates a ready future and attaches this thing as a continuation to that future. It gives you it back because otherwise, uh, you would run out of stack at some point. You, because this would call this. So this analyze would call something else, possibly like this again, right? And at some point you could run out of stack. And I actually had that happen in a very broken way. I did something wrong, but it got very ugly. Uh, so those futures not only give me a way to cache the result of analysis, or rather the status because it's a void future, uh, they also give me a way to escape the uh, limits of the depth of the stack. I do everything asynchronously, so everything gets like a fresh quotes stack every time it executes the next, next part. All right, so everybody here probably wrote this, future, this function once, right? If I use one, then return one, otherwise, it should check for, for less than, for like zero and less than, but I didn't care about it. So this is a recursive function. So to analyze what this is, we have to analyze the signature of the function and the body of the function, right? To actually know what the hell this thing is. But to analyze the body of the function, we have to analyze the call to factorial. And to analyze the call to factorial, we need to know what the signature is, right? So the fact that I'm kind of suspending the analysis at some point gives me points where I can exchange execution with other, uh, with other analyze functions to actually interleave the execution, kind of as if those were actually coroutines which allows this to analyze. Now, uh, let me make a tiny little change to the slide. Did you notice it? This is the function that I want to write. I don't want to have to say that this function returns an integer. And also, if this was C++, uh, and i times factorial i minus one returns something different than an integer, this would not compile. Which is not a problem, problem in this case because it's all integers, but uh, the I, I think the most common case where I really deeply hate the C++ rule that the first return determines the type and all the others have to be th the same type as the first one, is where I work with optionals. I would like to sometimes have a path that returns a null opt and then another one that does make optional something. And I want that to work without me having to spell out the return type, which is horrible. So my language is trying to do this. I have not implemented it yet, but there's, there's one additional complication here, uh, which is that we basically have a system of equations to solve now. It's not a hard one to solve, at least for a human, right? But it's a system of equation nevertheless. This shouldn't really have been a equals equals. I should have looked what mathematical symbol makes sense for like equals modular conversions because this is what it does, right? Sometimes uh, you, you want those to convert bet between each other like null opt or into an optional. Uh, <coughs> this would be kind of hard if, if you didn't suspend somewhere inside the analysis. Because you you go down and down and down and recurs at infinitum. So a function definition will generally first analyze all, all the parameters. Uh, then it will analyze the return type, 
which is also an expression because that makes sense, and then analyze the body. Uh, this is a problem. Does this work when I use a name of a parameter to the function in the return type? So I first analyze the parameters so I know exactly what those are. Then I analyze the return type. This is fine, right? Because yeah. I've analyzed everything and, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, it's slightly less fine when you do the other thing and that is call the function itself inside an expression that constitutes the type of one of the parameters. Which is why the return time probably should have been analyzed first. Because the return type, when it, it, it has an identifier into one of the parameters, it can call analyze again. It can force the parameter to be analyzed. But if, if the return type is not analyzed, then uh, the parameter will try to call a function that's not analyzed yet and this will never finish executing because no future will have a ready continuation to run and the thread will, will prob probably run forever. <coughs> uh, that, that, that's another project that I, I want to undertake at some point. So detection whether I got to the stage where nothing happens anymore. Because when we do just a loop, we can control what, uh, what is going on and detect where nothing is done anymore. But in this case, it's kind of harder. You have to ask the thread it's running on whether there is anything cute or not. And you have to have a way to actually terminate your application where something goes wrong. All right, uh, any questions so far? Yeah. I mean, it looks like you could technically, by writing your own future, uh, have the graph of dependencies be explicit. Yeah. Uh, in the, the yeah. Solver. Yeah. The comment is that by writing my own future, I could, I could implicitly draw the graph of dependencies, and and validate whether that's correct. Yeah. That's so that's that's how I want to do this. Yeah. Effectively. So, so the rest of the comment is that you need to do a global gra graph analysis. And then you can just levelize the graph with your, you know, you don't have to loop anymore. <laughs> yeah, you can then flatten the graph and make the world appear easier. Yeah, sure. That, that's how I want to do this. I just haven't gotten to it yet. And this is my own future, so that's not a problem. All right, uh, let's jump into the dark depths of the real world. Uh, so as I said, uh, looking into GCC is not my favorite thing. Uh, looking into the GCC source tree is already making me not want to look further because of the names of the files. Uh, Clang is slightly less horrible, but uh, I've spent what? Three hours yesterday trying to uh, trying trying to understand what is actually going on there, uh, and I still haven't found the entry point. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how well you can see that. Maybe if you it's visible from here. Is it? Yeah, you're good. All right. Uh, maybe the comments are not, but this is th there is more code here and here, and there is obviously code here and more code here and more here but it just would not fit on the slide in any possible way. Uh, so this is, this is parse export declaration. So this is a part of the parser of Clang that deals with the module CS. Uh, what? What? All right. <laughs> uh, maybe if you close the door, so it's, or maybe this is the main culprit. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it should probably be better, right? Uh, okay, so first it checks whether there's export, the export keyword. Uh, then it create it calls a function called act on start export decal. Uh, my 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 short journey into Clang uh, taught me that some of the names are not very sane. There's one that was like 60 characters long. Uh, we're glad we're not in Fortran. Yeah, we should be glad we are not in Fortran. But it kind of feels like so when you see decal, decal, decal. Uh, so so there is a call to act on start export decal, which returns a decal star. So this is the parser, but it doesn't actually create any node in anything. It calls, it calls the function from the semantic analyzer, and that function does the work. Uh, so then if, if there is no brace, no opening brace, we just parse a single declaration and tell the semantic analyzer we are done with the expert declaration. Otherwise, we loop basically until we see a closing brace and parse as many declarations as there are, and then again tell the semantic analyzer we, we are finished. Parse external declaration is a gigantic function that does like a million things. But when you, when you go inside and see what it does, every function it calls eventually again calls the function from actions. So in effect, they are kind of behaving like coroutines. One calls the other, the other goes back. But this is, you, you could see this like, like this function and this function are like a single thing that's just interleaved with the parser. Uh, so what act, act on start export decal does is it creates an export decal, uh, does some diagnostics, then does some, di some diagnostics, uh, create a con con uh, sorry, create a creates a context for the for the further declarations it is going to parse, so it knows what is going on, because semi is a class, so all the context necessary is um, is uh, stored in members. Uh, sets module ownership kind, so it basically says that yeah, this is exported, and returns the declaration. And then act on finish export decal. This is the one that you should actually be able to read. Uh, it uh, it gr if possible grabs the location of the closing brace. Uh, there's like oh no, we are not actually diagnosing things, and then removes the decal context, uh, context so that the code can continue. So this is what I, what I was talking about before. Clang doesn't actually consume an AST from the parser because it doesn't have an AST from the parser. Instead of creating an AST in the parser, it immediately calls the functions to consume whatever is going on. And they don't get the full state, they only they have to mark, oh yeah, I'm starting a namespace or I'm sta starting a set of export declarations and then only the further calls will actually make stuff work. <coughs> All right, so this is how Clang works and that's the end of the presentations. Any questions, discussion, uh, suggestions that I'm doing something very wrong are very welcome. Yeah. Um, so I am pretty sure that it's a type zero language, and here's why. Uh, it is a type one language only if the language can be recognized in polynomial space uh, by a Turing machine. But since you have a Turing complete language with templates, you can embed an exponential space problem in templates. Uh, for instance, like checking whether two regular expressions recognize the same language. Uh, and then require the compiler to use exponential space in order to determine whether or not the Turing is correct. Yeah, so, so the comment is that type 1 uh, requires that the language be recognized in polynomial space, right? And you can, you can create uh, exponential problems 
at template instantiation times in this in C++. Yeah, uh, I, th I think it's a kind of similar argument for uh, li like the one I mentioned previously that you can construct a program that is either syntactically correct or incorrect depending on whether a define is a prime number or not. Uh, well, possibly. Uh, prime number, is, uh, prime, number uh, prime factorization isn't necessarily in, uh, isn't necessarily an NC-complete problem. Um, but also, that doesn't necessarily mean you need uh, exponential space. It just might mean you need more than exponential time. Or uh, you might need more than polynomial time. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily correspond to exponential space in your compiler. All right, so the requirements is the requirement is only on the space. The requirements no. on the server. All right, so, so the comment is that uh, checking whether a number is prime doesn't necessarily require exponential space. It might require exponential time, but that's not enough for a type zero language. All right, thank you. Yeah, so the comment is C++ plus my plus made it much worse by having weird contexts, contexts where stuff is much more complicated. So what I'm interested in is the set of changes that you made to your language in order to not be a short of the part. So the, the question is what changes are made to the I made to the language to make it not horrible to parse. Uh, I'm trying as much as possible to make it like LL1 or LL2. Uh, I know of one place that I haven't implemented yet uh, where if I want this to have the syntax that I want to have, I'm going to have like LL star, but that's fine. It's one place. But I'm, I'm trying to strive for LL with a K that's a finite number. Where where LLK means that I can implement it with a recursive descent parser, with a look ahead of at most n. Great. Yeah. Uh, I was I was looking for more like which specific features did you need to omit or oh which. Uh, so the biggest one the, 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 the question is what what specific things I I omitted. So I didn't actually start from from C plus plus build up. It's more like of a top-down drummer design. Uh, a lot of the things I, I only fleshed out while writing the parser, which actually allowed me to not invent too many things that needed like infinite look ahead. Uh, so, so probably the biggest the biggest thing is that my uh, my declaration syntax is not insane. So it looks like most of languages that are not ancient. So let name colon type equals blah. Or uh, as, uh, yeah, this would be let, uh, no, sorry, this, this would be let b equals a dot pointer. Uh, as you've seen in the function, it's also the same there, right? So again, I just do a name colon type, which means that I, in the future, I can just allow omitting the colon type and have a uh, variable that has a deduced type. While in C++, if you, if you try to do something like that, uh, which we have learned during the standardization process of generic lambdas, for example, uh, you have no clue what that means because it can be an unnamed parameter of type i or it could be a uh, autorefrev parameter named i, and you have no way to actually know which one that is. Yeah. Um, uh, have a suggestion. Um, if you want to find the entry point to find the NNN, <laughs> you can force an assert inside the compiler, and it will basically give you a file path. Yeah, so, so the comment is that to find the entry point of Clang, I should use some debugging tools which is like the most horrible suggestion I've heard and I have heard it before, yes. Uh, I, I have a better way. You use the 
cash, 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 cash. Uh, but that only that only gives you the actual invocation. It that doesn't. It only gives you the actual invocation, but it only <coughs> will not spawn another process, which LADD cannot follow. I, I thought maybe oh, you don't have a suggestion. You said uh, client client check tools are just one uh, uh, front end in in a single process. So, so the comment is that there is one of the tools just runs the thing in a single process. Does it actually run the full semantic analyzer? Yes. All right. Yeah, All right. That could be helpful. Although I just randomly, I, I ended up like randomly opening parser, like parse decl CXX. And from there, I managed to actually understand how it works. So it's just like, 15,000 lines of code in a single file is a little bit too much for me. <laughs> right, is that all? Cool, thank you.